Well, welcome to the Digital Library. Today, um, we'll, we'll have an educational webinar on Postcards from the Borderland, Borderlands, The Borders of Our Minds, presented by local author David H. Mould. My name is Helena Richardson. I'm the Ashtabula Public Library Branch Manager, and just want to say welcome to the virtual library. So today, we are traveling the world. Well, or rather, we're traveling across borders. In his latest book, Postcards from the Borderlands, David wants us to think about the meaning of borders. Are they simply political and geographical, marked by posts, walls, and fences, or should we think of them more broadly? David H. Mould is a professor emeritus of media arts and studies at Ohio University. Over the last 25 years, he's traveled widely in Asia and Southern Africa, mostly for work with international agencies. He was born in the UK, worked as a newspaper and TV journalist before moving to the US. He's the author of many essays and articles on travel, history, and culture, and three books on Central Asia, the Indian Ocean region, region, and now on border regions. Kirkus Reviews has described him as a genial travel guide, an academic who does not like to write like an academic. <laughs> if you have a question that you'd like to ask David um, during the Zoom program or on Facebook, um, if you're on Zoom, you can put a question in the Q&A box uh, down at the bottom. Um, if you are on Facebook, you can post a comment on Facebook and we'll get it to him that way. We may save the questions to the end of the presentation and have a short uh, survey. Uh, if for some reason we run out of time, please feel free to submit your questions to ask us at acdl.info and we'll get, we'll get an answer back to you soon. So the webinar is going to be recorded and posted on ACDL's YouTube account soon. So you can watch it again and share it with friends. If you're attending in the audience, you will not be recorded, so this will just be um, David on screen. So welcome, David Mould. Thank you for being here. Hello, thank you very much, and thanks to the Ashtabula County District Library for hosting this session today. Um, those of you who are live with us, welcome. Those of you who are going to be seeing me recorded, welcome too. Um, and I'm going to try to live up to that billing from Kirkus Reviews, an academic who doesn't write like an academic, maybe also an academic who doesn't talk like an academic. Um, so, as Helena said, our topic today are borders and borderlands. And this is something that's really fascinated me since childhood. I grew up in the United Kingdom and my parents took my sister and myself on camping vacations in France and Spain and Italy and other countries. And for me, it was always really exciting to cross borders, to go from France into Spain or to Italy. Uh, I mean, just the thrill of going across that border, having your passport examined. You know, there was never any problem, but it just felt like a really cool experience. Now, as I've grown older and um, worked as a journalist, uh, worked as an academic, I've come to think of borders in a broader sense. Um, not simply as physical or political barriers, but um, as something something broader. I, I think about whether there are borders within countries marked by ethnicity, religion, um, economy, and also the way we think about other places, what I call the borders of our minds. And so this presentation is loosely based on the final chapter of my book, uh, Postcards from the Borderlands, which I think the library is getting very soon, um, and kind of pulls together some of my ideas uh, about about borders, you know, really collected over a lifetime, but actually mostly over the past 25 years. So this is, these are some of the places I've been in the last quarter century. I'm not going to read the list there. Um, as Helena mentioned, I've been working for international agencies, most recently for uh, UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund. And so in the process of working, I've traveled across a lot of borders, and I've also written about them. So um, I, this is my third book on travel history and culture. Uh, the first was on Central Asia, um, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, some of the 
stands uh, where I lived and worked uh, from the mid-1990s through to about 2012 or so with frequent visits. Uh, the second monsoon postcards on the Indian Ocean region. Most recently I've been working in India and Bangladesh but also Madagascar and Borderlands kind of brings together um, experiences from other countries as well. So um, we're going to be traveling to Africa, Central Asia and South Asia but let's start on more familiar ground we're talking about borders um, in the United States and I'm going to pick on New Yorkers now. I'm sorry for any New Yorkers in the audience. Take this in the spirit in which is it, it, it's intended. So the question, what are the borders of New York City? So this is a, a rather well-known New Yorker cartoon from 1976. And it kind of humorously reinforces a lot of research studies that show that we tend to expand or inflate the borders of our own cities or communities think that they are larger and more important than perhaps they really are. And so in the New Yorker's view here, um, you know, the rest of the United States, I don't think Ohio appears there at all, certainly not Ashtabula County, uh, that's compressed into a couple of city blocks and the rest of the world are distant a distant shapes there, um, you know, with the Hudson River being really the boundary of civilization as we know it. So um, this is actually not a new perception. This is uh, from more than 40 years earlier. This is by an artist called Daniel Wallingford, um, and he sold these maps by mail order. And uh, look at how large New York City is compared to the rest of the country. I mean, Brooklyn is, you know, larger than many states there. And, you know, what we would consider to be the Carolinas, the coast of the Carolinas becomes lower New York Harbor. Um, so, and you know, as you get out west, the states go to sort of crazy places, Oregon and Washington swap places. You know, the rest of the United States becomes kind of vague because, hey, the center of civilization is New York City. These are sort of the borders of New York City, the borders of, shall we say, the borders of the mines of New York City. Um, Let's take a couple more examples of how the United States is viewed. And I'm going to take um, um, the view from the Soviet Union and then from Russia. So uh, what you're looking at here is part of a map that actually I have framed at my home. Um, and this shows the kind of the northeastern United States. Uh, uh, from northern West Virginia through Pennsylvania to New York State and uh, into, New, into New England here. Um, this was a Soviet-era school map and um, I bought it in Bishkek, which is the capital of Kyrgyzstan, uh, in 1996, I believe. I mean, just because it was a cool item and I wanted to bring back a souvenir. At the airport, of course, uh, the customs officials informed me that the export of historical maps was strictly prohibited. So we had an argument and I paid a small bribe or gave up some little knick-knack from my suitcase and I went on my way. Um, at that time, I didn't know much Russian, but as my Russian improved, I started to look at this map and ask questions about it. Now, mostly this is um, an economic and demographic map, and those black symbols you see on there on the legend uh, show mineral deposits. Ugol is coal, neft is oil, um, Zelezny Rudy would be iron ore deposits. So it's showing you know, it's showing mineral deposits and population from the period from about the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century, till about just after World War I. The thing that fascinated me, though, and I couldn't figure out, were those red flags, which were the most prominent symbols on the map, more prominent than, um, you know, the, the dots that indicated the names of cities. 
And uh, my clue were the dates that were under them. I quickly figured out, I mean, uh, I'm a historian by training, these were the sites of industrial unrest, strikes, um, you know, other, other, um, other movements by workers um, in the late 19th century into the early 20th century. So you have the great railroad strikes in Pittsburgh, you have the homestead strike. So this to me was very revealing because it indicated to me how the United States was mapped, how its borders were mapped um, in the Soviet education system. The literal translation of the on the legend of the map is that these red flags are for Rabochi Divisionia, literally workers' movements. So um, in this map, the real borders are not um, borders between states, so those are represented. The real borders uh, on this Soviet school map are class borders between the working classes and their capitalist bosses and the government supporting them and suppressing the workers. Very, very interesting uh, in terms of the way I think borders are perceived. Now, you might think that <coughs> this kind of view went out the window when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Uh, but, you know, still a perception exists, and I think it still exists in, in Russian media today, that the, so, that the United States, you know, does have class divisions and racial divisions, uh, which are important. Um, this is one of my favorite maps. Um, this is the English version of a map by a Russian academic uh, who was fairly prominent in the foreign policy community, a guy called Igor Panarin. And he predicted that immigration, economic decline, moral degradation would trigger a civil war in the United States, which would lead to its disintegration. Um, and um, various parts of the United States would either become part of or fall under the domination of a foreign power. Um, well, I see Ohio's only going to be part of Canada. That's not too bad. Um, here in West Virginia, where I live, we're going to be part of the European Union, which is probably good news because my former country, Britain, just left it. Now, you know, this looks... You know, this looks strange. This looks silly in a way, but uh, you have to understand how people in the Soviet Union felt about the collapse of the great Soviet empire. Um, oh, oh, it was a very attractive, shall we say, conspiracy thesis to think, hey, the United States is going to fall apart just like the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, when I was working in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan in the uh, around 2004, 2005, people would come up to me and they said, when is the United States going to break apart? And I said, that's silly, that's ridiculous, what are you talking about? No, that's not going to happen. And they said, ah, it has been shown, it has been proven. And so this thesis was pretty widely circulated here. Now, um, the media reports of it often missed out the qualification from Panarin as an academic. He said, actually, the risk of this happening is between 45 and 55 percent. But, you know, that qualification, that caveat got ignored um, in, in most of the reports. So it looks silly in a way, but is it any sillier than this? Um, on the left, I have um, uh, one of many maps I think that have done that to sort of poke fun at the way in which Westerners or Americans stereotype Africa. And uh, so you can see some of the, you know, some of the, you know, the labels we may place on things there. The map on the right, I think, is actually in some ways a little more revealing, at least of kind of the way in which digital culture uh, affects the way we look at places and the way we look at borders. So this is one of a series of maps that's been produced that analyzes um, the most common adjectives that Google uses or Google autocompletes when you type in the question, why is such and such a country so? Why is Nigeria so? 
Why is Kenya so? Why is Madagascar so? Why is South Africa so? So we got a lot of poors, a few hots, a few violence there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, let's recognize, and I'll come to a later example here, how, you know, how digital media, <coughs> digital maps may, um, you know, may shape our view of places that we don't know. So my takeaway from all of this is that we all construct these kind of mental maps or borders of our minds based on who we are, our political views, our values, our gender, our race. Um, but in a sense, some borders that exist in the world, some real borders, make no more sense than our mental maps. Um, I was a history undergraduate in the UK and um, I had to, I was studying the period between the 16th and the 19th century in Europe when everybody was fighting everybody else all the time, so it seemed. And the borders kept shifting as one country or one city state grabbed a bit of another one. Um, so I had to keep track of all of these changing borders. But when I opened the atlas or looked at the globe and looked at other countries around the world, particularly Africa, the Middle East, but uh, parts of Asia as well, I started to ask, why are some countries really weird in terms of their shape, with portions of territory protruding into other countries, especially why are the straight line borders, particularly in the Middle East and Africa? So here's the answer, and uh, this is Africa. Um, these are artificial borders. They were drawn by political leaders sitting around conference tables in European capitals, carving up the continent of Africa into their own spheres of influence. And then over the next half century or so, defining those borderlines. And you can see how many of them are kind of straight or artificial. And these borders took no account of where ethnic groups lived. Uh, they took very little account of topography. Sometimes rivers were used, yes, but often topography, mountain ranges and such made no difference there. Um, so, um, it, you know, it was an artificial creation of borders where borders had not existed before, or should we say different borders had existed. And this is well summarized, I think, in this quote from this rather stern looking guy, Lord Salisbury, the British Prime Minister. And, you know, he's meeting his French counterparts in London in 1899. And they're trying to figure out where the border between the British con colony of Nigeria and the French colony of Niger is going to go. And he says, we're just drawing lines on the map. We have no idea, you know, if these cut through uh, mountain ranges or lakes or, or, or separate ethnic groups into two things, you know, we have no idea what we're doing. We're drawing lines on the map. Um, now, there is a principle involved here, um, and I'm going to mangle the Latin here, excuse me, uti possidetis juris as you possess under the law. This is a principle that says, when a country becomes independent from its colonial power, um, it retains its old administrative borders. Uh, this is a principle that was really first enunciated in the 19th century in South America when the, when the Spanish Empire was dissolving and the Portuguese Empire as well and the new countries retained the kind of the Spanish colonial borders. So the former Spanish colony became Argentina and another one became Peru and another one became Colombia and the Portuguese colony of Brazil became Brazil. Um, and, you know, it was a way to avoid border disputes, you know, just to use those old um, colonial administrative boundaries. The other principle here you can use, which is a messier one, is one of self-determination, where upon independence, people or their leaders try to figure out whether they're going to keep those old borders or cut up the colony into, usually into smaller ethnically or religiously based sovereign states. Um, 
look at what's happened in Africa, or what really what didn't happen in Africa. The, the map on the left shows the borders in 1914, in the colonial period. Um, and on the right, um, you see post-colonial Africa after about 1960, when most countries became independent. Now, there are a few things that have changed. South Sudan was recently created as a country, but look at the borders. You know, most of these countries have retained their colonial era borders without any change at all. Um, and that, of course, is a recipe for conflict, uh, because in many, most countries in Africa are multi-ethnic and have many groups that would like to have autonomy. They want their own country or a degree of autonomy or feel they're being oppressed by another um, ethnic group that's in power in the capital. So dividing up Africa using the colonial borders um, really did create a situation where you have artificial countries with artificial borders. Any straight line border has to be an artificial one. Could it have worked out different? This is one of my favorite maps it's by a Swedish artist called Nikolai Sion. And he did a study in 1844 of tribal units and kingdoms in Africa. Uh, and this was before the colonial powers started uh, carving up the continent. And in Islamic cartography, uh, the south is north and the north is south. So, you know, as you see, Africa looks quite a little different in terms of borders from the way it turned out to be. Now, if, if the colonial powers had not come in, would there have been conflicts? Of course there would have been conflicts, but, you know, it does kind of present an interesting kind of counterfactual to the way in which Africa turned out with those artificial colonial boundaries. At least many of these borders were primarily based on on ethnic and tribal ethnic and tribal groups and the land that they controlled. Um, okay, we're going to switch now to um, the Soviet Union. And I'm going to make the argument here that Exactly the same thing happened in the Soviet Union when it collapsed as happened in Africa when all of those countries became independent. So I'm going to really have to compress history a little bit here. Um, uh, in the late 19th century, Imperial Russia, the Russia of the Tsars, its armies advanced eastward to take over Siberia and southeast into that area, the more colored area, um, uh, the region called Central Asia, which is a region in which I've, I've, I've lived and worked quite extensively. Um, now, after the 1917 revolution, the Soviets inherited Imperial Russia, basically. And they were very worried about Islam in certain parts of the um, uh, so certain certain regions in the Caucasus and in Central Asia, and they were also worried about ethnic groups because before the Russians arrived, people in Central Asia their loyalties were not to you know states you know they their loyalties were to extended families and and clans and tribes and conglomerations of tribes. In, in many areas, people were heard as they moved around. There were no clear borders. So the Soviets started gerrymandering the place, creating borders and creating nationalities, uh, where really there were no nationalities before. And the, the sort of the joke I tell here, but it may not be that much of a joke, is that in Central Asia, in the mountainous part of Central Asia, the Soviet cartographer would be standing in a stream and he'd point to a shepherd on one hill and say, ha, ah, you're a Kazakh. And he'd point to a shepherd on the other hill and say, you're a, you're a Kyrgyz now. And we're going to draw the boundary along this riverbed or along this stream bed. Artificial boundaries created to divide and rule, to suppress ethnic groups by dividing them up, keeping them divided. Um, so what happened in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed is that the Soviet Socialist Republics it, it had created 
um, uh, for the Cossacks, the Uzbeks, and the, the Kyrgyz, the Tajiks, the Turkmens, suddenly became independent countries. Okay? Now, during the Soviet times, people were able to move relatively freely. Okay, if you were in one Soviet Socialist Republic, you could travel to another one. You just get the train or get the bus. You could visit your relatives. You could go to the market. You could go to university in another place. Suddenly, in December 1991, national borders have replaced the um, administrative borders between the Soviet Socialist Republics. And suddenly, you're not in the Kazakh SSR anymore, you're in Kazakhstan, and you can't get into Kyrgyzstan or get into Uzbekistan, even though your relatives live, live over there, or even you've got friends there. So the, the national borders were created exactly in the same way as in Africa. Basically, the Soviet or the Russian colonial borders were preserved in creating these new new states. Um, and uh, look at this region here. This is a region called the Fergana Valley in southern Kyrgyzstan. And look at this crazy border. Um, um, the, the the sort of the shaded or the yellow green part is Uzbekistan. And see how it curls in and out of Kyrgyzstan, and there's a bit of Tajikistan sticking there. That's all artificial. That was the way in which the Soviets divided these Soviet Socialist Republics so as to suppress um, ethnic ethnic um, ethnic loyalties. So in this place called Osh, which is in the um, in the southeast here, um, that's the second largest city in Kyrgyzstan, but half of its population is ethnically Uzbek. So it's a real mix of nationalities in this area, and again, you know, it was divided up in this really strange way to divide nationalities so that no group would be dominant in one place. So when when people woke up in December 1991 and went, oh, I'm not a Soviet citizen anymore. I'm an Uzbek citizen or a Kyrgyz citizen. Problems arose. Um, in this region, and it's one I've worked quite a bit in, there have been ethnic conflicts, also conflicts over natural resources. Um, Kyrgyzstan, a mountainous country, has a lot of water. Uzbekistan needs it for its cotton fields. Uzbekistan has natural gas, which Kyrgyzstan needs for industry and for home heating. Now, when the Soviets were in control, they could just say to the, they would say to their 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 officials, release the water for the cotton fields or send the gas. When these became independent countries, suddenly that central control was lost, and. The problem is classically demonstrated, I think, by um, um, the two cities here, Osh and Jalalabad. They're respectively the second and third largest cities in Kyrgyzstan. They're separated by it's only 30 miles apart, kind of on either side of a large valley there. But in order to go directly between them, you've got to go through that little bit of Uzbekistan. You see the dotted line there. And the Uzbeks will periodically close the border, or they'll hit drivers up for fines, or they'll do all sorts of things. So many drivers, in fact, take the much longer 65-mile route around via that little place called Uzgen to get from Osh to Jalalabad, or vice versa, um, simply to avoid having to cross through Uzbekistan and all of the trouble and all of the hassles. So basically, Uzbekistan doesn't cut off commerce between the second and third largest cities, but its border is a huge problem for anybody wanting to do it. Um, okay, I have to end this section with one of my other favorite New Yorker cartoons, which kind of pokes fun at our ignorance of this part of the world. And so these are the five boroughs of New York with uh, Middle East, with Arabic and uh, Persian and a few Yiddish names imposed on it. Uh, the Flatbush Tunes, uh, the district of Kandibar, Hip Hopperbad is one of my favourites there. And you know, just I, I, I'm trying to keep this bipartisan here. 
people who should know better um, about um, issues like this, such as John Kerry or George Bush, um, that I think pretty well demonstrated, you know, the broader ignorance of this sort of big geographical blank somewhere between Iran and China. And so did my colleagues. I'd come back to my university I was, and, I, and they'd say, where have you been? I said, I've been to Kyrgyzstan. And people would say, where? I said, Kyrgyzstan. They go, uh, is that near? I don't know. You know, the, eventually they'd give up. They'd say, you've just been to Stanland, which actually is total nonsense because the word Stan is a Persian word that means land. So literally I'd been to land land. <laughs> pretty symptomatic of the way, you know, we view or the way we kind of ignore this part of the world. Okay, we're going to look at what I think is, you know, actually historically the most tragic border story, the division of British India, or the partition of British India in 1947 after World War II. Um, and this is a place where that principle we've talked about, uti possidetis juris, was not followed, where a principle of religious self-determination was followed instead, dividing up this vast subcontinent simply on the basis of religion with drastic consequences into Hindu-majority India and Muslim-majority Pakistan. So, brief history, British India was cobbled together over a period of about 150 years by an outfit called the, uh, uh, the East India Company, which started as a trading group, but basically developed into a military power. So if you were a Maharaja in 19th century India, and you wanted to attack a fellow Maharaja and grab a bit of their, country, their territory, you'd hire the East India Company to go do your dirty work for you. <laughs> Eventually, the, the British Parliament shut them down, and it became a colony, but... Uh, um, uh, but, you know, at the end, we have a large area controlled by the British and um, by World War II, it was always really clear with the Indian independence movement that India would have to become independent in some form, at least after World War II. Um, so look at the map on the right, and this doesn't show the detail here, but by 1947, when independence was declared, India consisted of some large provinces, about eight, about 13 provinces, which are yellow here, and princely states, which were technically not controlled by the British. Uh, the British controlled foreign policy and defense. Uh, the, the princely rulers had some control over their internal affairs. So how are you going to divide this country up? How are you going to create new countries? Um, the major um, bits of pink there, the princely states are shown, but in fact, there were a total of 565 princely states, some of them quite small. So, um, when we get to 1947, um, it's not certain what's going to happen. I've circled Hyderabad here, um, um, a state and a region where I've worked too. And the, the, the ruler of Hyderabad said, why can't my princely state become a constitutional monarchy within the British Commonwealth? We are a viable country. At that time, 1947, uh, Hyderabad had a population of 16 million. It was about the size of Britain itself. Its economy was the size of Belgium. No, it would have been a viable country. Um, but that was not to happen because the principle of religious determination uh, changed things. So, um, one by one, each of these princely states opted to join either India or Pakistan based, based on the majority religion of the population, Hindu or Muslim. Um, there were three provinces which, where there was pretty even division in terms of um, religion. Um, 
one will come to a little bit later, Jammu and Kashmir in the north and the Punjab, which is just south of that, and in, in, the, in the east, um, Bengal. Um, and again, an area where I've worked, I've spent a lot of time in Bangladesh recently. Um, Bengal was a big British province, a fairly pros a prosperous one too. And the British had div tried to divide Bengal along religious lines in 1905, arguing it was too large to administer. Um, Bengalis didn't feel that way. They felt more united by language and culture than divided by religion. I mean, Bengal uh, was the, uh, you know, in the 19th century, there was a, there was a tremendous a literary and artistic movement called the Bengal Renaissance, which produced a Nobel Literature Prize winner. I mean, it was a thriving culture there. Yet, the British tried to divide it along religious lines. That failed. But then in 1947, Basically, the same lines were used to divide between uh, a predominantly Hindu West Bengal and what then became East Pakistan. Um, so the, relig the principal religion being used. Here's the guy who had the tough task of drawing those lines. This is Cyril Radcliffe. He had no experience in India. The British sent him out and gave him about six weeks to draw the lines in Bengal, to draw the lines in Punjab and in Jammu and Kashmir. He had inadequate resources and uh, the British were in a big hurry to leave. So when the, the line, the final border was announced, um, in August 1947, you know, it ran through the middle of villages, sometimes through the middle of people's houses. A lot of people tried to move. This was a recipe for uh, what today we would call ethnic cleansing or religious cleansing. We'll never know how many people uh, died in the communal violence that followed and has still racked the uh, India and Pakistan today. Um, and what's the result? I mean, look at the map here. Does Pakistan make any sense at all? It's two parts separated by 1400 miles of India. Uh, West Pakistan tended to dominate politically and militarily dominate uh, East Pakistan, even though the two parts had about the same population. And as I said before, you know, um, the people of East Pakistan uh, were Bengali. They felt more in kin to their Hindu um, uh, Bengali speakers in Calcutta than they did to people in Karachi or Lahore. So after um, West Pakistan uh, um, attempted to impose its its language Urdu on the east over a period of uh, you know about a quarter of a century. There was a, a resistance movement which ended in a nine-month liberation war in 1971, leading to independence for Bangladesh. Okay, but again, the folly of trying to draw borders following religious lines. Um, Bangladesh today, um, uh, um, I, I, I think I've been there, I've had seven or eight visits there over a, relatively recently, and the border is absolutely crazy, about half as long as the US-Canada border for a very small country, about the size of Illinois or Iowa, although it's got a lot of people there, about 170 million, about half the population of the United States, so it, it's pretty crowded and it's had a lot of Rohingya refugees there arriving as well. Um, the Economist once called it the world's craziest border because, as you see, it's you know, you know, it's surrounded almost completely by India, small border with Myanmar, but the, this crazy border snaking in and out. This is a result of those lines drawn in 1947, attempting to separate the two religious groups, and until hmm, five years ago. 
there were a bunch of territorial enclaves. An enclave is a bit of one country that's surrounded by another country. And in this part of the border, it looks like there's a skin rash that's broken out of the border, all those little bits of green, uh, which are, are bits of Pakistan and uh, the sort of the pink red are parts of India. Um, the, you know, and this obviously survived these enclaves survived the liberation war so it then became between you know bits of india and bits of bangladesh on the other side of the border people isolated in these little in these little pockets of land uh including one uh the only counter counter enclave so that's a bit of india surrounded by a bangladeshi village surrounded by more india in bangladesh it's um it's it's mind-boggling but the people there basically were stateless for years so uh the world's craziest border that's almost an understatement okay we're going to finish with confession time uh my cartographic crimes and if you want to report me to the indian government go right ahead because i will continue to break the law i'm a serial offender here um and it's all about maps and borders um look at the area in the north of india here and uh, the area around stringar getting towards tajikistan that is jammu and kashmir and this is an official map of india that shows all of that province a former princely state as being part of india so i confess i've come in with maps and even republished maps that have shown something different because this is actually what the state of play is here pakistan administers about 30 percent of the princely state of jammu and kashmir uh, the line of control there is that line drawn by cyril radcliffe's um, uh, surveyors in 1947 and India never accepted this. So if you look at an official map of India, the whole region is shown to be part of India, even though it is not. And uh, India and Pakistan have fought three wars over this region. Tensions remain high. But India is incredibly sensitive about this issue. Um, I, I pointed to the um, the the law and the customs regulations in 2016 uh, the government of india headed by narendra modi actually floated a law which um would publish cartographic criminals including myself i suppose with uh, up to seven years in jail or a fine up to 50 million 15 million dollars for publishing or issuing quote unquote incorrect maps maps that showed pakistan um controls or you know the territory of about 30 percent of the of the princely state of jammu and kashmir now they shelved that legislation but still it shows the high sensitivity about borders so um, <laughs> Uh, I talked a little earlier about, you know, the challenges of, uh, you know, digital culture over knowledge. Um, and, you know, let's recognize that on printed maps, we can sort of look at some details here. Um, Google Maps has an incredible influence over the way people perceive the world. And because Google wants to do business, or needs to do business in every country, uh, Google shall we say localizes or nationalizes its maps so if you're sitting in india and you're pulling up google maps for the region of jammu and kashmir you'll be happy to see that all of it is within india however if you're across the border in pakistan and you pull up the same pull up google maps you'll get a rather different view of the region uh, of jammu and kashmir which shows uh, the line of control the actual the, you know, the real border on the ground between the two two countries so um I'd like to thank you for um taking the time to be with me here i do pretty regular travel blogs i'll be happy to add you to my email list uh, um, just uh, drop me an email davidhmold at gmail.com 
and um, you don't have to read these things. But you know, uh, right now I'm putting out some stories about Central Asia, which you might find interesting. So thank you so much, and I'll be really happy to take any questions that come up. Okay. Helen, I think we're back to you. I can stop share here. All right. Boy, well, thank you for sharing that. That is a lot of information. I have about five pages of notes. Let me get them again. Um, let me, we do have some participants on Zoom, so I'm going to bring up a poll. If you're watching on Zoom, you should, let, you should be able to see a poll, and there are about five questions. There's a slide bar on the side, and the first, oh, no. <laughs> this isn't the right poll. Well, you could, the first, how did that happen? I'm going to close that poll. <laughs> uh, that, sorry about that. That was a tech glitch. Um, we do have time for, for you to click on the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, and you can plug in your questions. I don't see any here quite yet, um, and I'm looking over at Facebook to see if anybody has left a comment below. I think everyone is probably still rapidly taking notes and I think my mind just exploded when you were talking about the the Google Maps view and how it looks different from one perspective to another. Uh, but... Yeah, and that, and that I think happens in a few other countries as well, you know, and I mean, it shows the, you know, uh, the difficult balance that uh, you know a, a multinational company like Google has to has to preserve. You know, to what degree does it represent reality or reality versus the need to, you know, the need to do business in the country? I think it would be fascinating fascinating to hear your perspective on um, America's districts and gerrymandering and things like that. But not today. Oh, oh, oh I'm 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 not going there at all. I deliberately, I, in fact, I deliberately avoid that <laughs> that topic. We sort of, you know, I think it's okay to talk about politics in other countries, but you know, right now I'm going to stay out of American politics. Yes. Sounds wise. Well, we do have a, a question that popped up from David Richardson. The question is, do you find similar dynamics in Latin America? Um, I I have not traveled enough in Latin America really to um, um, talk about that. I, and I wonder whether David Richardson has and has some has some experiences there. I mean, I think you get you know hassles across borders there. I I mean, I think many of the border disputes in Latin America have kind of sort of settled down a, a, a little bit. I know Peru and Ecuador had one for some time. Um, um, is, is is he on Facebook or is he on Zoom? He's on uh, Zoom. So he... Oh, are, are, are you able to unmute his mic so he could uh, sort of, maybe he has a, a, um, a, a, Latin, a Latin America border experience to share because I'd be really interested to hear that. I might need help from our other tech person. So I, I don't know that we can unmute, but if he wants, oh. uh, maybe we can. Yes, we can. Um, I've allowed David if Richardson, if you want to unmute your mic, you're welcome to do that and you can ask questions. Okay, I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can, we can hear you fine, David. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I assume you've traveled more in that region than I have, right? I have never traveled there, but I'm very interested in the Amazon uh, tributaries and the ah. fact that they extend so far east into the Andes Mountains. And I think there are conflicts between the Latin American countries on the west side of the continent mm -hmm. and Brazil on the east side. And there are geographic as well as ecological and political implications, which strike me as, as a very interesting place to watch. I think it's a fascinating place to watch, and a one that's kind of under the radar. And I'm really not going to speak about it because it's not really kind of within an area that I've worked on at all. But I think you've summarised that really quite well. You know that you know because of the way that watersheds are, you know, different countries will have different economic and environmental interests. I mean, they do say, I mean, you know, the next the next wars are going to be over water, you know, and resources there. 
and so and you know one wonders about uh, what what other countries think of the you know the, the clearing of the rainforest for agriculture the burning and things like that so yeah i think it's, i think it's a i think it's a that's a fast that would be a fascinating area to watch because then you know again the political borders or the you know the borders on the maps really you know don't match too well with the economic borders and the you know and the natural borders and the environmental borders yeah hmm. good interesting well thank you for asking that question and we've got he, two more. He, he, he's given me more work to do now <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it, I mean, I thought that's a very, very, very good observation there, yeah. yeah. Well, here's the next one. Um, how This is from Lynn Baker. How do we exist without borders since they can be problematic? And is it possible? Is it possible to exist without borders? A world without borders? Oh, um, is he on Zoom? Um, I believe she is, yes. Ah, okay, I'd love, I'd love to... Yeah, you know, sometimes I just really want to hear other people's thoughts on this. Hey, Lynn. Oh, Can you? Okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so do you think we could exist without borders? Yeah, I'm thinking that this, you know, what New World Order or something. They're talking yeah. all one big, one big uh, happy people all together. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I mean, it, it's a lovely idea, and I mean, you can go back to the communication theorist Marshall McLuhan talking about the global village. I mean, there was this notion that the internet and maybe then social media were going to connect us all, and you know, and then we'd sort of, you know, we would have no need for borders, and we would all communicate, and democracy would thrive. I, I, I think what we've seen here, though is probably that technology uh, may have thrown up even more borders, you know, than, than existed before, or at least intensified borders of a different borders of a different kind. So, uh, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's a one, it's a wonderful thought. Um, I, I, I suppose I have to be pessimistic about it. Uh, please be more hopeful than I am, Lynn. <laughs> No, I think I, yeah, I don't see how we can. I mean, I'm uh, I'm sort of a person that is in favor of borders. I mean, they they do they do serve a purpose. You have to have uh, administrative divisions of certain kinds. Now, how strict those borders need to be, I don't know. And I mean, as you know, it's quite interesting what's happened in some parts of the world as trade agreements have happened, and so there's more free trade. I mean, in in Europe, for example, um, I can no longer sort of relive the childhood thrill of having to show my passport when I cross a border, because now, or at least before the shutdown because of the virus, uh, under something called the Schengen Agreement, uh, you could drive from Portugal to Poland or from Greece to Denmark without having to show your passport at all. You know, once you enter the European Union, and not just the European Union, because there are other countries in it as well. So, um, yeah. So I, I, it's. Um, I, I, I just think we need to be a bit more flexible about borders. But then, of course, the security people will say, no, we've got to tighten borders. It's going to continue to be a tension, I'm sure. Well, thank you, Lynn, for asking that. Yeah, and, thank you, Lynn. Yeah. Um, when, when you were talking about, uh, I believe, the internet, that leads right into the next question from Susan Jay. And her question is, how can Americans get to see the maps that Google shows folks elsewhere? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, um, I, 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 I don't know, but I can try to find out. Is that an honest answer? I'm trying to think. I think what I, I, I think that one I got came from a Washington Post article. OK, um, so but maybe if you. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think you've actually physically got to be somewhere there. So um, let me let me investigate that, and then I, I don't know if um, 
Helena has your contact information, but if I can find the answer to that, I will. Um, but there was, I could certainly set a reference to a really interesting analysis. This is just a little bit of it that I used because I was talking about India, but there was a very good Washington Post article eh, maybe a year or so ago, which kind of looked at the, the Google tyranny of maps. So let me at least dig out that reference, okay, and, um, and, 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 and send that. Or if you want to email me, um, um, I could I could just correspond with you and at least give you give you that. So, um, David H Mold, M O U L D at gmail dot com. So if you if you want to drop me an email or, uh, um, then I can just at least send you that reference. But uh, um, I'm it's it's an it's an interesting question you know how can you kind of sort of transport yourself to another place to see how somebody in india or somebody in pakistan is looking at it good that's a that's a really good question <laughs> i love I, 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 I love questions yeah. i i actually might have the answer to that question as our oh you do you do okay great possibly i don't know for sure i haven't tested it <laughs> there is something you can use on your computer it's called a vpn that's a virtual protected network and when you use that on your computer, you can tell the network that you are in a different country. Oh, okay. So I use that sometimes to watch Netflix from England because I, I log onto my VPN and I tell them that I am going to be in England and that's what it thinks where it thinks that I am. Oh. You might be able to use a VPN to pretend that your computer is in Pakistan and yes. and Google might respond to it that way. So that's that's one method that you might be able to use to spoof your computer into thinking you are somewhere that you are not. That's great. And for anyone who doesn't know, that is Rebecca Moisio, our marketing coordinator, who is answering the question. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> she is an expert in many things. Um, and we do have one more question here. Um, it's a big uh, one. By, by the way, Helen, are, are you really an Ashtabula or are you pretending to be there? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> <laughs> so the last question is, um, from W. Cornell, this is good fences make good neighbors. Please comment. <laughs> um, yes, in principle, I'll agree with that. I mean, it depends how we define a good fence. Um, is um, W. Cornell available to uh, to speak on this, or is this a Facebook one? Again, again, I you know, I I'd, I'd like to hear the. The questioner's thoughts on this while I collect sure. my own. Yeah. Hey, it's, yeah. It's, it's a saying I saw at the uh, one of the Amish museums. I think this one was in Indiana, that good fences make good community. And they talk about the Amish uh, willingness to live uh, within the boundaries they set for their lives, maybe not borders, but, mm. you know, other kind of boundaries. But, uh, you know, it's a common proverb, good fences make good neighbors. So when you were talking before about, or the question about, uh, you know, do we need borders at all? Can we live that way? Well, we might be better at keeping peaceful communities if we do have fences. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, well, well I'm, I'm going to give you a sort of a facile answer here and say, hey, we should, you know, you know, we need good fences. We just need better borders. Okay, borders that are better administered, that you know allow for more, you know, commerce and flow of pe of people there. So, um, yeah, it's um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, it's interesting you kind of raise the Amish because I think that their conception of borders and community. Um, are not, you know, not really the same as others as well. I, I think they, you know, they, they, I mean, you know, the Amish as far as I know, they, I mean, they think very broadly about the Amish community and, you know, which can be across the United States and it's not defined uh, just physically there. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's something, something certainly to think about. I, I, I don't have anything very deep or philosophical to say on this. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you for asking and, and also for answering that. Um, we do have an Amish population in Ashtabula County and and yes, indeed, um, Rebecca and I are in Ashtabula. We're on 433 Park <laughs> Avenue. So please come visit us. Our building is open fully for business and we'll also deliver it to your home just in case anybody wanted to know. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't trying to set you up for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But by the way, I, I just want to say these have been terrific questions. These have been really, really smart. Um, uh, the, the fact that I haven't been able to answer any of them uh, very well shows how good the questions were. Okay. Well, and everyone has your email. And when you go back, we're going to post the video on our YouTube on ACDL's YouTube channel, so you'll be able to pause the video at the end and see. Um, David's address, um, or you can email us at askus at acdl.info and we'll forward your questions straight to him and he can get back to you that way too. So either way, we'll get you answers um, and go from there. So I think I think we're about five o'clock right now. So almost an hour on the nose. This is a lot of fantastic information. And I, I think I don't see any new, any new questions right now. Okay. So um, people can send those to us later. Thank you very much for uh, crossing, cr sh sharing how, how borders function and kind of expanding our minds about how they work. Um, I was, I'm, I'm getting ready to go back out into the world. So I brought my, my oh, uh, look at that. Oh, that. Of, of oh, that's flags. <laughs> so. no, that, yeah, you're, you're preserving those African colonial borders there. <laughs> So, so maybe I'll think twice about uh, wearing my mask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and here's a comment from one of the listeners. Thank you for an informing, engaging presenta presentation. We'll share it. Okay, that's great. Well, and and, and thank, uh, thank, thank, uh, thank you, Helena, um, Rebecca, and um, everybody support your local library. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone.